Uh, thank you, both of you, for coming this morning. Um, I, I see there's like a whole wave of them outside waiting to be let in. They're just being blocked. Um, so my name's Simon Jones. I, I'm the uh, Product Marketing Director from Uyala. Uh, I want to thank uh, Streaming Media East, Dan, uh, especially for this show. And about you, I'm finding out all sorts of things. Everyone learning a lot from the show? I'm saying everyone, all three of you. Yes, good, excellent. Um, so this morning, what we're going to be talking about is the economics of mobile video and how to build a, a profitable business. I don't think it's a shock to anyone to hear there's a lot going on in mobile right now. Shameless plug time. If you were to go over to the Uyala.com website and look up our video index, uh, we produce once a quarter a study of all of the video that we're delivering around the world and then try and work out what's really going on. And the thing that we have learned uh, every time we go is mobile as a share of video viewing is growing like a weed. Uh, last, I was actually just this morning, I was editing the next video index, which I now can't tell you anything about, uh, other than to tell you it's growing even more. We're up to uh, well over 20% of the videos that we serve now are going out through mobile. So really the big question is, how does that become a business? How does it grow up? How do the, uh, the tools change? Uh, and how do all the people involved in the ecosystem work together? And we're very lucky this morning, I think, to have a, a really interesting range of voices from across the industry. Uh, I'm joined over here uh, on my left uh, by Mike McLeod, uh, Uyala customer. Thank you, Mike. I'll pay you later. Uh, who is the uh, Senior Manager of Advertising Products and Technology at uh, PGA Tour. So if you want any golf tips, he probably uh, knows a guy. Not the one to <laughs> <laughs> I can put you in touch with some people. Put me in touch with some people. All right, good. Uh, next to him uh, is Ben Elbaz, uh, who's a marketing manager from All Winner Tech. Uh, he's actually based out in China, so we're looking forward to not only hearing his views on this stuff from the perspective of hardware, but also from the perspective of being somewhere that isn't America. Turns out there is a place that isn't America, and we need to be thinking about it. Uh, and to Ben's left, uh, we're joined by Joanne Voga. All right, yep, got the Norwegian, all right. Uh, who's the uh, Senior Vice President of Business Development and Head of Content Acquisition at Moby TV. And as you can imagine, with a company name like Moby TV, I'm assuming she's going to tell us mobile is quite important. Um, so I wanted to give each of you a couple of minutes just to introduce yourselves, tell us a little about yourselves and what you're doing with mobile. And I'm English, so we'll go ladies first and start with Joanne. So um, I work for a company, as you've, you've heard, called Moby TV, and Moby TV has been around for about um, 12 years now. Um, we started out in uh, doing data delivery, sort of packetizing data and, and sending it in a compressed fashion, and um, then subsequently learned that we could, or figured out that we could use that to deliver video. We were really the first to put video on mobile phones, so we have been in the business for a long time. Um, we started out as a um, as an application uh, on Carrier Wapdex way back when called Moby TV, and uh, we delivered you know multiple live uh, channels from some of the biggest brands like MSNBC and Fox News and Discovery, etc. It was really cable for your phone, um, and over um, over the last you know I guess eight years um, we uh, transitioned to being the white label. Um, managed service provider for all, basically all of the U, major U.S. wireless carriers, mobile video solutions, um, aside from Verizon, who doesn't have a multi-channel service at this time. So we are the um, we are the the brains, um, we'd like to say, um, and the technology and content behind Sprint TV and movies, T-Mobile TV, U.S. Cellular TV, um, and AT&T Mobile TV. Um, we, but we don't just do mobile. Um, we are, you know, a full-service video delivery um, platform, uh, and that uh, platform powers all of the TV Everywhere extensions for Deutsche Telekom in Germany and um, uh, a couple of other providers. And we are now also building what will be the largest IPTV deployment in the world um, in Asia. But it is confidential, even though they announced it. I'm still not allowed to say who it's with, um, but that will launch sometime this year. So um, so that's that's uh, what we do. When I think the kind of most interesting thing that we're working on right now um, is we're actually stepping into the hardware business. Um, we, uh, our partnership with the wireless carriers in the US is our video provider 
um, is, is very deep and very strong. Um, wireless carriers, pretty much like anybody else with a network, wants to figure out how to own the home um, and kind of come backwards into the living room. Um, and our solution for our wireless carrier partners on that is, um, is to utilize a, um, a dongle, an HDMI dongle, to uh, take what's on their phone um, into the living room. And so for us, we see actually the home screen, the TV, as the second screen, and mobile tablet as really the first and primary screen. So we talk more about that later. And I want in on the beta program. There you that go. sounds like lots of fun. <laughs> My kids will kill me, but it sounds like fun. Yeah. Terrific, thank you. Uh, ben, tell us a little bit about yourself, about All Win Attack. Sure, sure, sure. So, kind of a quick question is, Has anyone heard of our company outside of a uh, quick Google search? No hands. That's good. Well, what we, what we do is, uh, uh, to give you a little bit of perspective, we, we design, uh, my background is kind of more in the hardware ecosystem, so very, very device-centric. Uh, and we design processors that, that power a lot of uh, Android tablets and, and other uh, OTT streaming boxes. So as of, as of 2012 uh, and through 2013, we were actually the leading supplier for, for Android tablets worldwide. Uh, so the perspective from us is very, uh, very device-driven, very, very hardware-driven. But it also enables us to have more of a global perspective. Because uh, if you look at our customer base, like end devices that are shipping uh, worldwide, about, uh, even though we're a China-based China company, about 20%, 20 to 30% of end devices that are, that are powered by, by our products ship into North America and, and Europe. And about, I'd say, 40, 40 plus percent in, are into emerging markets like Southeast Asia, Brazil, India, et cetera. And then the other, uh, the other percentage is, is, is in China. Uh, so we're, we're having some discussions recently about, about revenue models. And I think from our side, you know, we see a, a pretty good perspective about how to operate globally. Um, so that's a little bit of my background, the company's background. Outstanding. Thank you very much. And Mike. And so um, it, it's uh, interesting. I feel like we've, we've got a full spectrum of the, the ecosystem here. Um, I'm with uh, PGA Tour Digital, and we're a content owner and publisher. And... Um, if Moby TV um, wins the hearts and minds in the living room, we want PGA Tour uh, content to be there. And um, I'm senior manager of ad products and ad technology. And so we want to have the right kind of pipes and partnerships to, to monetize those video views um, if Moby TV gets in the living room. And um, the uh, tablets that, um, that Ben uh, creates the guts for you know, we want those tablets to be running PGA Tour uh, digital uh, content. And um, so very quickly, PGA Tour um, has a website. It's responsive. So we offer video um, on the web uh, that covers tablets and that covers the mobile web. Um, we have an iPhone, Blackberry, Windows 8, iPad, iPhone, and Android app. And most of those apps have video. Uh, I'm not sure about BlackBerry at this point. And um, we're a customer of Uyala and use Uyala to, to provide our uh, OVP in many of these situations. And, um, and uh, my job is to help make sure we're getting the most monetization out of all those uh, video streams as we can. Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. All right, so that's us. Let's, let's ask you about you for a second. By a show of hands, who has an iPhone in their pocket or about their person somewhere? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. How many have, oh, and, and yes, and, and Mike and I, I suppose. Uh, who has an Android device? Mm. Oh, you have both. That's just showing off. <laughs> Anybody have something which is neither? No Windows users. Yeah. No Blackberry, no Windows. Windows Phone? Windows Phone and a Surface. Excellent. All right, so that pretty much, that pretty much actually maps kind of to the, to the numbers out there. Um, Poor old Windows. I, I don't know that Windows device looks great, but right now it's a it's kind of a two horse race, I think, uh, between iOS and Android. Um, and so I guess the the first question I have, and, I, and let me start with you, Mike, because you shared some some data with us the other day. Is is it is it time for a mobile first strategy? There's a lot talked about today of you know start building on mobile and then get to web. Is it time for that, or are we still a little ahead? So. Um our numbers in April, including the, uh, this is not including live, this is just video on demand um, for uh, web, app, 
And then I'm also going to put the YouTube in there as well because we do a, a very good business in, um, in, in our YouTube channel. Is in April, roughly half of our streams were mobile and half were uh, desktop. And so the question, uh, is it mobile first? Uh, I think the answer is that the college cord cutters and the displaced dads who are watching video streams on their mobile devices make up half of our audience. And so uh, there has to be a, a multi-tiered strategy. Um, is that mobile first? Sure, I'll call it that, but it is what are we going to do on the desktop and what are we going to do on mobile? I mean, that's the question mm -hmm. that we're asking right now. I, I mean, I'm going I'm to come back to you in a minute, Ben, but obviously, Joanne, Moby TV, I, I got to believe that you would think that it's mobile first, but seeing as you started there, uh, do you think it's mobile first or do you think it's really not that well distinguished? Well, I, I, I think Mike is right. I mean, I think that um, you, you have to be where people are um, and you have to make a product that services, you know, the different screens based on, you know, what the expectation from that screen is. Um, however, I do think that um, you, I think that, that thinking mobile first is, uh, is wise um, and becoming wiser in that I think in terms of video, you know, the entrenched, um, the entrenched uh, ecosystem is really big screen first. Um, and mm -hmm. what we, you know, obviously in our business, we do believe in mobile first. We believe that, you know, there, there are, you know, every, almost everyone over the age of 12 in this country has their own mobile device and they're doing things with those that include not just, um, you know, calling, but video and games and everything else that, um, there is an opportunity, but also, as you see from the viewing perspective, you're seeing more viewing shift there. And I think something that's very interesting is, um, you know, as we look at millennials, <laughs> as we had this conversation earlier, the millennials, who hate to be called millennials, um, really are untethered. Um, they are, you know, they're, they're moving to college. Um, they don't have their own TV necessarily, so they're watching on their computers and their tablets, et cetera. Um, and they don't see, you know, TV as the big screen as something that's absolutely necessary. And I think, um, you know, it was mentioned in another um, panel, but it's something that we've been following closely is really what Dish is doing and the deal with Disney and that, you know, they're looking at um, a, a service that will target these untethered, um, you know, subscribers with um, a lower rate uh, that uh, a user can buy and have their, basically, their MVPD service um, be uh, mobile forward, be something that is, you know, based on streams and not based on households. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that that's, you know, I think that tells you something. Um, and then, of course, we from the wireless, you know, we're very entrenched with the wireless carriers. We see it from their perspective. Um, but as you look at the, you know, the pervasiveness of, of, of connected devices and those connected devices all having, um, uh, you know, having uh, apps that you can make your phone into a remote control and then with Chromecast and now our device that's coming out, having it be more than just a remote control but being the central navigation and search device for your video universe, whether that's, whether you're watching on your phone or whether you're watching on your TV, uh, we do think um, that it is moving towards mobile first and that it, mobile cannot be an afterthought. And I think it still is, in a lot of cases, a second thought. Mm -hmm. I think that's true. Uh, ben, do you have a, a, a position, a thought on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think actually, uh, thinking about this question, you have to ask, mobile first for who? And I think when you, if you look at it by market, if you look at the US specifically, it's very easy to say, yes, sorry, mobile first. I think we were making this point, uh, discussing a little bit earlier is if you look globally, if you look at global markets, there's different rates of smartphone penetration across the world, right? So in the US, for example, you have about 70% 70, 70 penetration rate. So in that, in that kind of environment, it's definitely gonna be mobile first. But if you look at other emerging markets where you don't have those levels of penetration, it's gonna be a different story. Uh, so I think the answer from my side would be it's very, it's very market dependent. Uh, depending on, on where products and services are sold, that's really gonna drive uh, you know, where your uh, strategies, priorities are. I think that's true. Now, turning back to the audience, how many of you in the last, let's just arbitrarily say a week, watched some kind of video product on your smartphone? Okay. <laughs> I like the people who are going, well, sort of. 
<laughs> I guess. All right, so, uh, you know, around about 50 50. Um, of those of you, actually, I'll just ask to everybody, how many of you, how many of you are staying at a hotel right now? Okay, not everyone's staying here. For those of you who are staying at the hotel, how many of you have switched on the TV since you got here? Okay, so then of the, so those of you who've switched on the TV and haven't watched a video on your mobile? Okay, all right, so we're consuming across. By the way, for those of you who have turned on the TV, Raise your hand if more than 50% of the time that the TV was on, you were actually sitting down watching it. None. Okay. <laughs> oh, one. There we go. All right, Joy. Wait at night. <laughs> All right. So, so it, it's interesting. One of the things that we've been seeing lately is that there's a very different usage path, right? When you, when you grab that mobile device, you're turning it on because you want to watch something, generally speaking. Oh, okay. All my other entertainment, including Netflix, Yeah. No, I. It's really the only thing I turn on TV set for anymore is for sports. And, and just, just to echo that, I simply had to watch Fargo last night. And if it had been available on a mobile device at a different time, I might have time shifted. Mm -hmm. right. But it's not available until I think three days until it gets released into video on demand. And by that time, you've seen all the spoilers and it's <laughs> ruined. But I think, you know, there's, a, there's, there's kind of a different usage pattern a lot of the time. And, and there are really two reasons people turn on the TV when they get to a hotel, right? It's either to watch a sport. I mean, beyond specific television shows, generally speaking, TVs are on in, in hotel rooms tuned to CNN because you've just got some noise going in the background or to sports. Um, and so there's this sort of usage difference, I think, to some degree where one can turn on the TV and have it be a background thing, and it's just sort of kind of happening, um, as well as the appointment TV, whereas with the devices, uh, it, it feels a lot more like when we turn it on, we're turning it on because we want to watch something. We don't tend to turn on a show on a smartphone and then sit it in a corner and then move about and do other things. So there's actually, although we're seeing the same things, we're watching the same things on lots of different, different, different screens, it's not really the exact same process that's being emulated, I think. And perhaps, if I might move on to a different, different area, that's a reason why um, advertising and, and building profitable businesses is not as uh, obvious and intuitive as it might be, because it feels like oh, it's a television show, I'm going to slap a television ad on top of it. That makes sense, right? It's all television. Um, but I guess really the question is, can mobile really sustain itself on, uh, you know, on an ad-supported basis? There was, I, I just looked up this morning, Tube Mogul just released a, a study. They said that the mobile ad inventory in Q1 went up by 350%, which is actually kind of stunning. Um, the CPMs went down, but only by 18%. So if we're talking about economics and the law of supply and demand, tends to imply there's plenty of demand for a relatively small supply. And by the way, the CPMs are still up over 10 bucks, which blows me away. So the question is, can, can we really build a business of mobile video uh, using just ads? Uh, and I guess as a sort of a, an aside, and something else that we were talking about before, is the public ready to not only watch video that's supported by ads, but actually to pay money uh, to subscribe to it? And I, I know we have one example in the United Kingdom, a company called Hopster, who brought together all the kids' shows and created this neat little app where you can, as a parent, hand the iPad or the iPhone or whatever to your kids and say, you can watch anything you like on this app because it's all safe. And by the way, I can say how long you can watch it for. Uh, and they're successfully licensing that out. So I guess it's a two-part question. Can mobile really... Uh, go ad supported and frankly is it possible for it to run as a subscription service and Ben why don't you kick us off yeah I think on um, on the on the ad side I'll kind of relay that to, uh, to to Mike for further clarification but I think uh, there, there was a point we were considering uh, about about mobile devices and, and, and a strategy and if you look at some of the bigger companies across the world uh, Amazon Google Microsoft and Apple they don't just deliver profit models from one segment, right? They don't just offer a service. Amazon just doesn't offer e-commerce and derive revenue from that. They all, they all have a hardware solution to back it up. Um, so I think in terms of delivering uh, a profitable business model, ads are, are important on top of the service that you're providing. But I think uh, a lot of companies, a lot of vendors should look at it more from perspective of, of software and hardware together. 
because there's different revenue operations, there's different revenue p potentials from, from those two areas. Uh, on the ad side, I'm not sure what Mike's perspective is. So of course it depends on your individual business. Um, um, but to a certain degree, God, I hope so. I, I, I hope that, <laughs> because the PJ Tour, a lot of its uh, revenue model mm -hmm. is, is built on ad supported. But as Ben mentioned, it, we don't have just one revenue stream. Um, video advertising uh, is premium advertising inventory. And another thing you alluded to is that um, the way we look at it is if someone finds a PGA Tour video on YouTube, they're more likely to be a casual fan um, if they download the iPad app and they are viewing live PGA Tour streams on the iPad app, that is probably a much more hardcore mm -hmm. engaged fan. And we would look at a strategy of, um, currently we don't have a subscription product, but we are definitely looking at a strategy of, you know, on YouTube and on the web, it is free and ad supported. And that is premium ad inventory that we can get um, um, higher, um, higher profits from. And then in the apps, when it is going to be a hardcore fan that goes to the trouble of downloading and viewing, you know, can we enhance the experience and either go ad free or go subscription and ads? So it is, it is going to take a mix. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there are many uh, people who uh, could operate a mobile video business um, that is completely ad supported. Yeah, I, I think one of the things which is often struck me is people keep talking about Netflix in a box, and I've often wondered why don't they talk about Hulu in a box, which seems to me like a more a sort of a more advanced hybrid. Well, model. They, ha they have both. They have ad and. This is what I'm saying. This is this is the business. So obviously you have a unique uh, perspective on this, Joanne, because you're working yeah. with some of these big guys who are driving. All premium content, I guess. Well, I mean, I think who, I mean, Hulu, you know, um, Hulu is ad supported and subscription, and they have ads in their subscription, and that largely comes from, you know, their ownership and and uh, and being forced by the content providers, you know, if you're playing in the current window to get ads in there. So I think, I think there's some restrictions in terms of whether they could do that sure. behind the paywall, ad supported or not. Um, but I, I think that you know. I, I don't think it's that much different from the web. I think that there um, is certainly an opportunity to extend or to create a mobile first, mobile forward, um, ad supported, you know, viable ad supported um, business. Um, however, I do think that you know the gold is the gold mine is always sort of the dual revenue stream where you have ad supported and you have subscription. So that is what you know you see pretty much everybody trying to achieve, including YouTube with their premium channels, though not doing so well with those. Um, we have a thriving um, subscription mobile service. Um, and uh, at, you know, it's um, uh, largely, I think, um, successful because we have a unique position in the market and that we're preloaded. So we're sort of there. Mm -hmm. People find us easily and discover it. And it, they don't have to do the app store. They don't have to figure it out. Um, but, uh, but I do think that, um, I do think it's, I think, Ad support is possible, hasn't matured yet. People haven't really figured out, you know, delivery, all of the device issues and all of that, but it will, and, and I think you'll see, uh, you'll see many players playing in that space. And, and think, I'm oh, sorry, they didn't, please. You were talking about mobile and you asked some questions, but are you considering mobile? That's a really good question. Is an iPad mobile? Yes, I would yeah. call that mobile. I'm trying to sort of to, to segment between phones and phones and iPads, but yes, and I mean that's actually one of the questions we'll get to in a little bit is sort of what is the future of that of that device uh, profile. So we're, we're sort of working our way through that. I did just want to f uh, sort of circle back with you, Ben, because we were talking about this whole subscription ad supported sure. thing in the week running up, and you made a really interesting observation about sort of the regional nature of the willingness of the of the mobile user to, sure. to subscribe. I, I wonder if you wouldn't mind. Talking yeah, a little sure, bit about sure, that. Sure. So we were talking a little bit about uh, about different revenue models and, and, and localizing revenue models. So I think for for a lot of companies out there, it's it's easy to to really get bogged down in your own market. Uh, for example, you look at U.S. consumers. U.S. consumers are used to paying uh, paying for content. You know, they're even used to paying subscriptions. But I think 
if you look globally, specifically if you take a look at China, there's a really interesting example of, uh, of different revenue models. Like, I'm not sure if anyone here is really familiar with mobile gaming companies, but uh, Gameloft is a pretty big mobile game company. Um, and it's very interesting. With some of the, some of the initial games that they tried to do uh, in China, they, they tried to leverage their existing business model, so charging maybe four or five dollars uh, per game that they release over iOS. Uh, but that, that's, that strategy wasn't as successful as what they're doing now where you know, publishing freemium games uh, in iOS or in Android and then just charging for in-app purchases. So something like that, um, you know, it could be successful in the U.S., but in the U.S., you know, consumers are more, more used to paying for content or used to subscribing to content. But in, in other markets where consumers might not have that same propensity to pay for digital content, you, know, you have to think, you have to think uh, local. So I think it's really, again, it's very, very market dependent mm -hmm. what, what strategy is going to be more successful. Yeah, and I, I think one of the things, and we'll move on from this in a minute, one of the things I just discovered, again, I was, I was uh, editing our, our next video index, but we have observed that the conversion rate, so number of people who click on the play button when they're shown a video, is almost exactly the same whether there's an ad on it or not. Um, adding, adding that initial pre-roll across uh, however many pieces of, of data it is did not seem to actually stop people from watching. So there may be more of an opportunity there. Now, this actually may be why the ad inventory is going up as folks are starting to realize, I don't actually scare people off by putting an ad on there, and that's an opportunity to bring in revenue that allows me to build a sustainable business. Well, probably also, too, as you get more and more targeted with the advertising, right? I mean, if you, you know, can deliver an ad that's relevant to the user, then that makes sense. I mean, I think that's where mobile can be very, very interesting. I think, you know, you know, PC has been, or internet has been very interesting in that you can, get, you know, track, put cookies and figure out what people have been doing. But, you know, you add even more layers to that of, you know, geolocation and all of that other stuff. And then suddenly you really can deliver a very targeted ad. And I think, you know, you're seeing some of the carriers, the wireless carriers step in and, and um, try and provide um, a higher level of information um, to advertisers and to app partners, et cetera, mm -hmm. and you know, in turn taking a piece of the advertising or the revenue from it. I think you know, like Sprint with Pinsight um, is, you know, they're, they're, they're doing that device tracking that is sort of the gold mine that everybody wants in mobile and saying, you know, this user went to this app and spent this much time there and they watched this here and then they did that and taking all that mm -hmm. data and compiling it into a profile of that user in order to deliver an ad that's, that's really hyper-targeted. You know, I, th I think that's very true. I was at, at a meeting the other day with a chap from one of the big brand companies and they've now worked out how to track you through your social and your, mm -hmm. uh, your loyalty cards at the supermarket and so forth. And you're right, the, the targeting now is, is uh, it's really sophisticated, but that sort of takes us to a sort of an, an, an interesting question, which is I, I think that it's obvious to anyone. How many people have, have tried to do ads or do do ads on mobile right now? On those trades. Okay, so we've got a few. So, you know, one of the challenges, obviously, Mike, uh, we'll, we'll start with you here. One of the challenges is that the different modalities in which people consume, wow, that was a lot of syllables. Let's try that again. The different devices people use to look at video um, have different standards on them, right? You've got, you got your Android tablet, you've got your Android phone, you've got the 3.0, the 4.0, the KitKat, the whatever on earth comes after KitKat, Jaffa Cake, I don't know. L. Huh? Hell, yeah. L. 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 Oh, L. Okay, uh, Lego. L. I, I thought you said hell. I was, no, it's still yeah, code, code name. That was Freudian. Um, you know, we got the iOSs, we got all of these things. Do all of those different standards um, really present a tangible challenge when you're setting up your ad strategies, or, is it, or does it all kind of come out in the wash? The, um, the mobile ad serve, I can't say enough bad things about the mobile ad serving ecosystem at, at this point in time. Um, the PGA Tour Digital is, to a certain degree, a smaller niche publisher. Um, we're not going to go out like, say, for example, NBC Sports or ESPN might and hire our own development staff to bridge those gaps. To a certain degree, we are at the mercy of the um, video player integration with an ad server and um, the ecosystem for many years has been desktop dependent and flash mm -hmm. dependent and the move to server side ad stitching and the move to um, HTML5 
um, the capabilities that have been enjoyed for years and years in Flash um, are not quite there yet. Right. And so uh, to say go to an advertiser and say um, we're going to do this great fantastic uh, video highlights campaign activation for you and to simply work with them, their agency and their metrics agency through on the desktop you get X, Y and Z on the iPad, you get P, D, and Q. On the Android, you get X, Y, and Z, and P, and D, and Q. Um, by the way, <laughs> YouTube, we're going to work it this way. For live video, it's completely different. Mm -hmm. And oh, by the way, for the Twitter Amplify program, it is uh, you know something you've never seen before. It's a comquad. Um, and so to get the right <laughs> creative and to get the metrics all aligned across those platforms, you know, at the end of the day, um, the agency may say, uh, what's the click-through rate, and can I give you a 30-second spot that you encode? Thank you. And that's not the right. That's mm -hmm. not the right answer. And I'm and I'm um, I'm over, over. I'm being, you know, too critical and too hyperbolic, at one end of the spectrum. But um, trying to serve, you know, the best uh, Flash player that supports multi-views, and then uh, you know, Android to trying to support Android Android 4.4 Android 4 .4 and IE8. It's just uh, it's very troublesome. It, it is. Uh, what do you think? But about I think it? the ecosystem will get there. I it think will. it will get there, but uh, it'll take a while. It has to. There's a bunch of money hiding out in there. But I, I agree with you. So I, I wanted to ask you, uh, Ben, particularly. I, I, I know I was uh, talking to someone the other day. In 2013, there were literally 12,000 distinct Android devices <laughs> or distinct user agents. You know, given all of the stuff that's going on and trying to make things work. Because it's, as someone who's, who's out there sort of making these things work, is that going to get better? In the trenches, yeah. Someone who's in the trenches. So, by the way, my ads work on five of them. <laughs> 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 and you haven't heard of three of the five. Mike, I mean, you talked a lot about the, the difficulties in, in, in ad insertion, right, in the current, like, existing browser infrastructure and the, and the technology infrastructure. And I think what, um, what I can add some, uh, some guidance on would be is kind of cross-platform compatibility for, for the actual application that's been designed. Uh, and as you mentioned, you know, Android fragmentation is, is definitely a challenge for, for mobile app developers. You know, iOS is good because you have one hardware platform, you have one software platform, for every, so everything's a little bit more cohesive. Uh, but when you get into Android, there, there is the challenge there. But as we we're talking about for, for mobile app developers, game developers, or, or other services, there's actually a lot of ways to, to mitigate those challenges. Like there's, uh, there's cloud testing companies. So instead of having to actually uh, build those resources internally and have an in-house testing lab so you can test across all these other devices, there's actually uh, cloud testing services where uh, they, in, in a particular testing lab, they'll have maybe thousands of devices and you can outsource um, you know, the testing, like mm -hmm. the cross-platform or the cross-device uh, compatibility testing of, of apps to, uh, you know, to companies like that. So even though it's challenging, there are ways, you know, working through third parties to actually mitigate those, uh, those challenges. So one end, you know, is the ad insertion difficulties. The other, the other end is actually the app quality, basically the, not, not quality of, of service, but actually quality of, of performance. That, mm -hmm. that challenge can be mitigated. And, and, and Joanne, you have a, have a unique situation, as you mentioned before, often your apps are preloaded onto the phone, so you're not wrestling the HTML5 daemon down in the same way that the rest of us are. But does, that, does all of the fragmentation really have much of an impact on, on you? Not, not in that way. I mean, I think our, our, the bigger impact for us is simply um, the, uh, you know, the content partners shifting ad servers every year, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and integrating with those, and and um, also just the the there's still um, you know selling advertising for mobile is still an afterthought, mm -hmm. um, and so often it doesn't happen. At least in ours, we have we, you know we have premium video, so we work with you know in the current window with. Um, with a lot of the biggest players, you know, the Disney family of channels, and NBC Universal, et cetera. And it's, uh, they don't really struggle to get everybody advertisers. Everybody desires to do it, but it, it um, yeah, it, it's still, the kinks haven't been worked out. Okay. Yeah. All right, so we, we've got about 10 minutes left. So I got tons more questions I want to ask these guys, but it's your turn. So as soon as anybody has a question, raise a hand, and we'll go to your question instead of mine. Or we can just go on with mine. Mine are also good. <laughs> Uh, all right, well, well excellent. Well, I'm glad you said, so actually, I want, I want to address uh, uh, Nadine's question. 
um, which, and I put this to you before, and I think you all fairly well harumphed at me and said, don't be silly, but um, I read an article a few weeks ago that said, is, I think the title was literally, Is the Tablet Dead? And it, and it looked at it and it said, you know, the, sh the, the amounts of units getting shipped are sort of not growing at the same rate that they were, uh, but what's really growing are these really big screen telephones. And so, you know, today I think we draw a distinction between a telephone and a tablet. Is, d do you see a likelihood that those two actually do converge? And, and whether it's this big and I just stick a, a you know, a, a phone SIM in it, or whether it's coming back down to these awful phablet things, um, do you see a convergence or do you see us still sticking with there's a smartphone and there's a tablet and never the twain shall meet? Why don't we start with you, Joanne, since you I, I think it's kind of, I think it's going to be all over the map. I mean, I think those devices are going to be popular in some cases. I think there are people who prefer something a little bit bigger to watch their video and don't want to carry around that. I think you're going to see, I, I think you're just going to see choice, <laughs> frankly. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that, I think that's my answer. You're going to see choice. I personally don't want to carry around a phone that's any bigger than one that fits in my back pocket. So I will have two devices. And my tablet actually stays home. Um, uh, I know. So. <laughs> couldn't survive without my tablet. Well, Ben, you guys are building them. What, what, what do you see? <laughs> well, I think what, what you'll see going forward is, is not necessarily substitution between different form factors, but rather uh, addition. Because I think if you look at each, the phone, the tablet, and the phablet, e each of these form factors ha have differentiated functionality. So a phone is good for, for on the go. Uh, a tablet is good for at, at home, like browsing the web. You know, you have a larger screen. Uh, a phablet is kind of in, in, in between. But each of them have their different value adds. So I think uh, if you look at statistics right now and going forward, I think you'll, you'll start to see more people own more devices. So you'll have mm -hmm. a phone. Like people are already owning you know, an iPhone and an iPad, and I think that trend will continue. Guilty. All right. yeah. <laughs> Mike, you have a thought on this? Well, I wonder um, what's, we always seem to be U.S. focused, is, um, is the tablet dead? I mean, the question is, is the tablet dead in the U.S. and what is happening in Europe? And then what is happening in um, emerging markets? It may be that, that India and China, uh, the tablet is, uh, is uh, replacing the laptop. I'm so, well, well, the tablet the gets tablet. there before, the phablet gets there before the mm -hmm. desktop penetration. Well, actually, phablet um, or, or large screen phones are more popular in Asia because you have, a, let's take, for example, the, the Note 3 where you have a stylus. You know, so, so consumers in those, in those nations where they actually have like a, uh, a logographical writing system where it's actually in icons, mm -hmm. they, they, they write out the, the language in, in those icons. So it's, you know, as, as mentioned before, kind of the theme of this, you know, a lot of things are, are market driven. Yeah, I think that's true. And I, I, I don't know if anybody saw this week Motorola announcing their, which one is it? I think it's the Motorola. M, I think, or is it the G? Anyway, $129 Android smartphone, $129 off contract, by the way. Just walk into a shop and buy it. Uh, and their goal is to take the smartphone down to the, the less wealthy end of the smartphone users. They, someone described it as declaring war on the flip phone, which I just, I just love as a concept. I just imagine the flip phone going, no, we will destroy you. Um, <laughs> But maybe that's it. Maybe that, maybe that will be the answer. If we can get the, the, the less expensive phone in people's hands, they'll, they'll get used to that as the experience. Mm -hmm. I wonder if the tablet going away is the same question as when will the desktop go away? Mm -hmm. um, or when will poetry go away? These things tend to just <laughs> jumping, jumping disciplines there for a minute. Right. Haiku is still with us. Limericks as well. So, you know, they... Um, these things tend to stay around, but just get eased into a different part of the pie. So, you know, tablet may stay at 20%, desktop at 20%, phone at 20%, phablet at 20%. Yeah, yeah that's probably true. Hey! <laughs> uh, I have a question. Uh, Bill, you mentioned the tension between uh, the video playback in a browser setting Mm -hmm. You know, it, as as it kind of live comes along, you're getting more metrics, but a, a lot because of the fragmentation, you still are really reliant on, on a lot of the apps. I mean, I, one of the things that we're fighting with is discovery in the various marketplaces for the apps, is they're so saturated now. It's effectively mean, it's, it's far more difficult than in a browser setting where you can. Mm -hmm. 
Who wants to go first? And I'll, I'll, I'll say one thing on that is with, uh, with native apps, like I think the way I would phrase this question would be the, the, the different value proposition between native apps and, and, and browsers, like an HTML5 browser app. So I think you have, um, I think you have a little bit better uh, control over over the upgrade cycle within within the native app because there's a lot more features that you can do through through the native app and you don't have to wait for uh, for browser updates or you don't have to wait for updates to the HTML uh, HTML5 standard so I think you have a little bit more control over uh, over the progression of the technology in that in that space so I think that's one uh, that that's one area but I mean you do have the advantages of, of HTML5 and being very very uh, cross platform compatible. That is, that is where I guess some, some uh, at least from my point of view, some, some market, market segmentation comes into play is um, it, just looking at it through, through the lens that I know of is our HTML5, our, our mobile web video is going to be a more casual fan. It's going to be someone who found the clips perhaps through a search um, and it'll only be the more hardcore engaged user that goes to the trouble to download the app. Um, and we're finding that the app provides a better video experience. Those SDKs are much more mature than the non-flash HTML5 um, uh, mobile web that experience. Will feedback into ad sales, leveraging a higher CPM for a native app versus a web experience? Or, or what's the actionable step after discovering its greater engagement? Um, it is. It is. There's, there are different rates for, for app video than for, for web video. Um, and um, most of what we do is work toward a combined buy, which is, um, you know, you are getting desktop and mobile web and um, app as well. We tend to, to sell uh, by the content, uh, by audience and by uh, content, um, not necessarily by location. We're trying to move from, you're gonna, you're not you're going to, is we would like you to, sponsor highlights and if you're going to sponsor highlights does it you know if a person is on the train on their phone in the morning at their desktop in the afternoon in the afternoon and then at home with a tablet at night don't you want to sponsor um, the Phil Mickelson highlights on all three devices um, so it's more a content uh, play for us than a uh, oh we think the the mobile user is more value the app user is more valuable than the, the mobile web uh, but I could see that working for another business, though, is saying, you know, people downloaded the app, you know, I, we know more about them that perhaps we should charge a higher CPM for that. Are, do you have, that sounds like almost all direct sales, are you doing any programmatic advertising? Is that shift more towards the browser HTML environment than the app that you can kind of make a bigger sale for the native app? Or? We, we do do programmatic in both, in both app and on the, the desktop. And there are definitely uh, different uh, CPMs and different yields for both of those platforms. Um, I, don't, I don't know those numbers off the top of my head, but the programmatic marketplace is, um, is, is very different than direct sold. Mm -hmm. um, but in short, yes, I believe that you can get higher yield and higher price floors um, in app right now than, than mobile video. Joanne, I mean, you, you already only have to I, deal with the apps. No, yeah, but I, I, mean, I, I, I just I, I second what these guys say. I don't think I really have any more to add than that. I think they're different, you know, different users, and okay. there's a role for both. I mean, I, I, I'll share a story with you. We, we were working with uh, the Tennis Channel. We've been working with the Tennis Channel for a while, um, and they observed, as a lot of people have observed, that even though Android holds give or take two-thirds of the unit shipped and iOS one-third, that two-thirds of their video viewing was coming from iOS and one-third from Android. And this, this tends to hold across. Um, about a year and a half ago, and this isn't as, as shameless of a plug as it sounds, but we, at, at Yellow, we came up with this thing we called Hook, which is basically just an app. And so when a user goes to a... Uh, a video being served by Uyala on one of those Android devices and clicks play, it will ask them to download the app so that we can play the video in it. And I think almost everybody, I get that far in the story, almost everybody goes, well, do people really download the app? Um, turns out, yes. Uh, and I, uh, true, true story, I, I didn't really know they were going to do it. Anyway, Tennis Channel discovered it during the Australian, uh, the Australian Open 
last year, I think. Uh, and without really telling us, they just sort of started using it. That last weekend, as I recall, it was like 17,000 people downloaded it. But what they discovered was all of a sudden that one-third, two-thirds split reversed. And all of a sudden, the fact that two-thirds of the people had Androids meant that two-thirds of the video streams were coming from there. And they actually stuck around for twice as long as the, the iOS viewers because now that they could get the blasted video on that beautiful five-inch, you can see it from space screen, it was apparently a more enjoyable experience. I mean, I'm, I'm extrapolating, but it was, it was something that kept their engagement. So because of the limitations of HTML5, and they're all transitory, right? Eventually everything gets better. Because you can't really do the live, you can't really do the DRM protection, a lot of the things that are really tough to do, um, you end up losing a lot of potential audience because you just can't jam it through the HTML5 uh, particularly on the Android. So having that app capability, you know, that, that just that one experience is kind of a, a piece of evidence we base our hypothesis on, which is that if you can get the video to the Android user uh, in an appropriate way, they'll watch it. So that kind of means the apps are really important because that's how you get the high quality stuff and you can build out the rest of your so, experience. So, so two other uh, correlating data points is Twitter's consumption, if you look at Twitter's consumption, uh, they have much greater app consumption than mobile web consumption. Um, we were working with them on the Twitter Amplify program and, and putting PJ Tour content into uh, Twitter cards as a video, and basically, uh, and this is, this is not a secret, is basically they said, yes, we support our apps. Mobile web, the consumption is so small, we don't support uh, Twitter mobile web for the uh, in-video product. It's just the traffic isn't there. I think YouTube shares the same numbers. Is if the if you look at the YouTube consumption numbers, the apps I think far far outweigh the um, the mobile web uh, YouTube consumption. Yeah. So basically, go build some apps, I guess. But, uh, but it, you, you know, how summary. do you make it easy and seamless? <laughs> you know, if they're viewing mobile web, you know, just say hey. What's the quickest, easiest way, and it sounds like Hook maybe skinned that cat a little bit, is, you know, you're watching this video on mobile web, here's our, here's our video app, just how can you make it as, as quick and painless as possible? Yeah. Um, All right, well, stunningly, it's 12.32. We, we, we jammed through our time. I, I want to thank all of you who, who came and joined us. Thanks for sticking around. Uh, everyone's going to be around. We're easy to contact. And once again, I want to thank the streaming media crew for inviting us, and especially the panel for showing up. And uh, I think really interesting stuff. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you.